So my name is Maciej Bartkowski. I'm senior director uh, responsible for research and education at uh, ICNC. Uh, I have recently completed an edited volume on um, rediscovering or uncovering nonviolent history, and as part, and we are looking, we're looking at the civil resistance uh, in liberation struggles, and uh, we discovered that a lot of histories in a number of uh, liberation struggles, uh, particularly related to nonviolent conflict, they were forgotten, uh, and they have to be rewritten. So that book. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not available uh, as, at this moment. Uh, it's right now currently the manuscript under review. Uh, hopefully this fall it will come out and, uh, and then we'll be happy to share that with you as well. Um, the today's session, is, uh, which I will be uh, speaking about, is about movement, movement formation. And uh, Jack talked about civil resistance. What is civil resistance? The dynamics of civil resistance. And so we are, we are making a, a small step ahead talking about how civil resistance uh, emerges and Hardy then will continue about nuts and bolts of waging nonviolent resistance. Um, so with the question of when and how do people join nonviolent struggle or nonviolent fight, there is a puzzle. You know, when you go on to, uh, to PhD studies, uh, your professors are always uh, asking you, so what is so puzzling in your paper? Actually, I had that question probably at least once a week um, until I figured out that my whole department is quite puzzled by the puzzles. Uh, but it was excellent and I think a very um, creative way of approaching a number of issues. So I wanted to approach this, this issue of movement formation from a puzzle or a couple of puzzles that I um, discovered. So there are a number of dilemmas uh, when the movement is formed. First of all, we really don't know how others feel. <laughs> particularly in the closed societies where the opinion polls are not easily available. And even if we know that people may feel um, um, you know, quite upset by certain policies, by certain actions, we don't know whether actually this is the majority or maybe just the minority of the uh, opinion. Um, another puzzle uh, is, okay, we plan actions, we design campaigns, Will people join us? Will people come out? And then once something succeeded and we organized one tactic that brought uh, people uh, together, we don't know whether people will come again. Another puzzle, our dilemma, well, this is about um, essentially um, being faithful to um, um, essentially preaching what we, or practice what we preach. Uh, we are not sure whether we can continue practicing what we preach because of the oppression and because of the provocations. Will we be able to remain nonviolent in the face of regimes um, arrest, torture, and killings? And finally, are we really certain about our success? Is the uh, whatever we are engaged in in terms of mobilizing people, whether at, at the end it will produce results. So given those dilemmas, it's quite interesting, quite puzzling, puzzling how does a dissent movement emerge and how it's possible for um, civil resistors to come together and engage in, in, in nonviolent conflict. So there are a number of theoretical explanations um, used to understand how and when and why movements emerge. And I will go very quickly through those explanations. <laughs> uh, some people would say that, uh, um, particularly the first, the first kind of approaches to movement emergence, that we are living in the atomized society and we are longing for being together. We are longing for engaging in collective actions. And through that atomization, in essence, this is the reaction to atomization, we are coming close together. Then another approach emerged, social networks, where they would say, there are already pre-established contacts, family, friends, colleagues uh, at workplace, which we use actually to build the momentum, to build the movement. Relative deprivation would, would emphasize the issue that we are relativists or relationalists. We are comparing each, with, we are comparing what we have uh, with, with other people. Poles during the 1970s and 80s, they were, com they were comparing their own well-being to uh, the well-being of Germans economic well-being, what Germans had, what Poles didn't have. And that kind of uh, 
um, produce a momentum for mobilization. Rationalist choice approaches would say, you know, people are rational human beings. They evaluate costs and benefits of actions. So is it actually beneficial for me to join the movement? And what do I gain from being part of the movement? And what I can risk or what I can lose? Political process theorists would say that there are certain opportunities that are emerging um, um, throughout certain uh, periods of time. Uh, the government's uh, legitimacy is going down. The economic crises are rising. Uh, the capacity of the government uh, to oppress people uh, is, is also changing. And the movements can use various opportunities that are out there for its advantage uh, in terms of mobilization and waging the struggle. Ecological conditions approaches would emphasize the issue of location or space. Uh, they would say that mobilization may happen much easier, for example, at the universities, at universities' campuses. Uh, Birmese generals understood that very well. And uh, that was the reason why they moved university campuses outside of cities to rural areas, because they knew where the mobilization happens. Catalytic events uh, approaches would emphasize those trigger events. Self-immolation of uh, Mohammed Bazizi in Tunisia, um, um, rigged elections, torture of a, of a person who then, um, you know, the, the, that torture was publicized and galvanized people. Diffusion approaches would uh, emphasize the issue of learning uh, and diffusion of ideas about nonviolent resistance, particularly that theories are um, promoted by, one, uh, by two scholars who wrote about the choral re revolutions. Um, um, Volchik and um, uh, Bons, and they are emphasizing the learning uh, that took place uh, starting from Serbia going to Georgia and to Ukraine in terms of the diffusion of the ideas. But one can go in history and one can, for example, see how Gandhi, how much he learned from the nonviolent resistance that took place in Hungary. In 1850, 1860, Hungarians were fighting for the equal rights in Austrian Empire. And Gandhi actually knew, Gandhi uh, actually knew about it. And, and read a lot and, uh, and was quite inspired by what Hungarians did uh, in terms of winning the dual monarchy. Um, finally, resource mobilization approaches would emphasize what the movement has or what the movement can have uh, in order to wage the, str the, the struggles. So in terms of material, human resources uh, that the movement is, is, uh, is or the people are, are, are able to, to govern. And framing processes, it's, it's emphasize discourse, the language what Jack actually presented in the, um, I think in the, in the first uh, session. The importance of essentially um, producing a injust, or frame of injustice, a frame of shared grievances. Um, that, that's actually this, this kind of discursive uh, approach. The language is important in terms of mobilizing people. And of course, solar activity approach. I, I read about the protests in, in Russia in December, that happened in December, February, and, 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 and April and May. A number of astrologists said that solar activity was so high that time that actually produced agility and energy in, in, in people. So we have to remember about that as well. All right? Okay, so that's, that's the kind of overview of, of, um, of the kind of approaches to movement mobilization. Um, but another way of uh, looking into kind of nonviolent revolts and predicting nonviolent revolts uh, would be, and I did a, a very simple search uh, in Google about um, Tunisia and Egypt. And particularly I focus on, um, on the period between January 15 and Janu January 25th of 2011. So uh, the period when Ben Ali left Tunisia, whereas revolution in Egypt hasn't yet, hadn't yet happened. And I just type, you know, Egypt, Tunisia, and I got a number of uh, articles that said Egypt is not like Tunisia. That revolution should, will not happen in, in, in Egypt because of various types of factors. And I listed a couple of them. So people who were, and they were regional experts, you know, various types of uh, pundits, uh, um, uh, um, also experts or, or scholars in, uh, in, revolution, in studies of revolutions. And they said that, well, if we look at Tunisia, if you look at social polarization or kind of social homogeneity, it's much greater in Tunisia than it's in Egypt. Well, you don't have such a great polarization between Muslims and Christians in, in, in Tunisia. So it was much easier then to mobilize people than it would have been in, in Egypt. Then they were looking at nature, nature of regime. Some actually claim that Ben Ali 
was not as crazy as Mubarak. But more, being more precise, they were saying that Tunisia, it was a police state, whereas Egypt is military state. So, and the loyalty of the military, it's much more assured, particularly because Mubarak comes from military. So the defections in military shouldn't be as easy kind of um, uh, facilitated as, as it might have been in, in Tunisia. Then they were saying that Tunisians were actually more educated than Egyptians. They were more illiterate. And they had even access to internet. Many more of them had access to internet than in Egypt. Um, so they were saying, no, that's, that's not possible, again, the revolution. And then they were saying about, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, when they were looking into the organized labor, you know, the first trade unions that uh, were, were established in, in Arab world, they were in Tunisia. So the history of trade unions in Tunisia is very strong. But, it, but such kind of history doesn't exist to such an extent in Egypt. So the labor might not play such an um, important role uh, in terms of weakening the regime in Egypt, like it was in Tunisia. And then uh, finally, the pharaoh complex. Well, Egyptians were, you know, they're obedient people. You walk like Egyptian. You don't fight like Egyptian. You just walk. Uh, or you obey like Egyptian. Because, so even the Egyptians may have been able to, you know, accept the hereditary rule that Mubarak was uh, proposing to nominate his uh, so son Gamal to take over from him. And, uh, and that would kind of fall within this pharaoh complex that Egyptians had. So within a week after those predictions, revolutions took revolution took place. Not only that it happened, but actually it succeeded in bringing down Mubarak. Not regime, but Mubarak. So uh, the main thing that they got, uh, that those uh, uh, experts got wrong, was the focus on structure. They really didn't look at what ordinary people was, were, were doing. How did they learn from the past mistakes, from the, um, from the history where they were oppressed, they didn't succeed, and how did they kind of um, uh, took together the experience and learn to design better strategies and tactics? So what determines movement's emergence? There are a few studies that look at, uh, at this question, the kind of more analytical and, and statistical studies. The first one that you can download from uh, internet, and I believe it's on eClassroom, is Freedom House study uh, published in 2005 that looks at the environmental factors to explain the, the movement emergence. Uh, and they look at 37 countries that went through the transition uh, towards democracy that experienced the bottom-up civic mobilization. And in essence, their finding was that the regime type, whether it was democracy, whether it was a personalistic rule or sultanistic rule, or whether it was a single party rule, uh, that didn't really matter for the emergence of civil resistance. Civil resistance was present in democracies and in non-democratic countries of various types over history. They also said that in terms of economic uh, 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 development, that the emergence of civil resistance also, um, or that economic development didn't matter so much for the emergence of civil resistance. Civil resistance emerged in uh, least developed countries as well as in more wealthy um, uh, uh, democracies and, and wealthy countries. Uh, and they also look at the ethnic polarization, um, and this is the example of Tunisia and Egypt, that civil resistance emerged uh, in countries that were more homogeneous and countries that were um, more heter heterogeneous. And finally, they look at the decentralization and centralization nexus. And they discovered a slight correlation that indeed um, the issue of centralization mattered for the emergence of the movement. And they said that the that higher degree of centralization, the greater chances for the emergence of the movement. Now, if you were educated and ferociously, um, you know, intellectual dictator, reading all the academic studies, and you came across of that study, what would you do? Yeah, you would decentralize your country. Now, can you imagine any dictator decentralizing the country, de decentralizing or diffusing his or uh, we have only his, we didn't have her, his powers? No, that goes against the logic of dictatorship. So even that kind of, I think, study would not help much dictators. But he, he was very benign, I think. You know. He was a sustainable leader. Right? I mean, my, that's why probably he was, uh, he was quite accommodative to Hungarian demands then. Um, and one of the reasons why his monarchy survived. Okay, good. Um, until, the, until the war started. 
Okay, so now about the cognitive liberation concept. Um, this is really about you know, awaking. Uh, this is about activizing people. Uh, and what actually you know, takes to activize people, takes to awaken people? Well, you can take a tablet perhaps, and, you know, and whether you take a blue or, 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 or red tablet, uh, you, you, are, you still live in matrix or you are activized. Uh, this is actually, this comes from the protests in Russia where you had a choice between you know, 12 more years of Putin power. Uh, the, uh, the elections are every six years right now in Russia. Uh, so actually he will be staying longer in power uh, if he succeeds uh, than Brezhnev. Uh, uh, so that probably will be in total 30 or so years. Uh, or you will take the, the, um, um, uh, the red tablet, this you will uncover the truth and, uh, and put in uh, perhaps, or, and that truth will allow you to uh, mobilize against, against Putin. But in terms of uh, really going into nuts and bolts of, of this cognitive liberation, First of all, there is a realization among the people that the system is based on a lie. It's a major lie what we are fed uh, with by the authorities. And because it's based on the lie, the system is not legitimate in our eyes. Second of all, the system is vulnerable and its existence is not, is not something that is given. Thirdly, uh, the powers of the, um, of the government are not as strong as they thought to be. And the power of the people is not as weak as the people thought it would be. So uh, there is a realization that the power lies with, with the people. Also, there is a, 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 a strategic realization that if we, all, if we are able to mobilize, not tens, not hundreds, but hundreds of thousands, millions, that the risk will be shared and the probability of us being oppressed by the government would be much smaller if we mobilized in mass. And, um, and then there is um, the, um, the realization that uh, in essence the exist that, that resistance becomes part of our existence, part of our living. There is nothing beyond the existence. It's uh, resistance is our life and life is resistance. Uh, and, uh, and finally, this resilience that Jack emphasized, that this is a generation-long struggle. Maybe we won't be free right now. Maybe our children won't be free. Perhaps children of our children. But for children of our children to become free, we have to struggle right now. And we have to do that, not to wait for our children to do that. Right? So, where to look for cognitive liberation? Where to find it? Inside of ourselves. And this is the answer that Václav Havel offers to us. That obedience is induced by fear, by apathy, by certain awards uh, that we are, uh, are given by the regime, by the customs. But what is really important is that in every one of us, no matter how humiliated one is, we can feel the long for dignity. And this is the quote coming from Václav Havel. Uh, if every day a man takes orders in silence from an incompetent superior, if every day he solemnly performs ritual acts which he privately finds ridiculous, if he is prepared to deny his own self in public, it still doesn't mean that he has entirely lost the use of one of the basic human senses, namely the sense of humiliation. And the seed for feeling the humiliation, no matter how humiliated we are already, according to Václav Havel, this is the, uh, the basis for this cognitive liberation. So there is always potential for individual shift uh, in, in the thinking about where we are, what we need to do, and uh, with this individual um, emotional and uh, uh, psychological uh, potentials, there is also potential for, collect for collective actions. And uh, Jack alluded this um, in the question and answer time to what he refers to as unifying proposition, which I would um, call it as a kind of activizing discourse, that uh, a small group of people or maybe one person has to develop in order to 
galvanize masses. And I have a couple of examples of those discourses that, um, uh, that are taken from various cases uh, in historical struggles. The first one is, of course, from India. Um, the uh, kind of activizing discourse proposed by Gandhi was a very simple one. British are ruling the country for their own benefit. Why should we help them? We'll coerce them to leave, but on friendly terms. This is the call for action. This is also the definition of who we are and what we should do and how we should do that in a very simple um, paragraph, in a very simple sentence. Solidarity movement in Poland, you know, the communist Poland always uh, emphasized that uh, this is the workers' country. However, those workers don't have enough money to fed themselves and didn't have any rights, despite the fact that this was the workers' country. So there was the call for workers to organize based on strength. Don't do that by burning party committees. Don't do that through violence, because this would be the organizing on the strength of the regime. Let's organize on our own strength. And this would be by building our own committees, by building our own underground society, away from the control of the government. We will bring down government without challenging it by making it superfluous because we will organize ourselves the society and the government will no longer be needed. In South Africa, Steve Biko uh, proposed the activizing discourse which was about definition of racism. Racism is not about certain borders, certain people. It's actually about experience. So regardless what color you have, what color you are, you can feel being discriminated. So the fight against apartheid is the fight that is universal. It's the fight of all of us, not only black people. Um, in Egypt, I think that this that, uh, initial uh, activizing discourse was very, very much based on economy, on, on what, what people had and didn't have, which I kind of encapsulated in those in the sentence, uh, Egyptian has only two options in the dire economic situation he lives in, either to become a beggar or a thief. Why should we be beggars? Why should we become thieves? We have to do something about the situation. Uh, in the United States, um, activizing discourse that I could, I, could, I, I could identify, we are, of course, 99%. We oppose economic inequality and unfair treatment. And uh, that, of course, benefits only 1%. The 1% were bailout, whereas the homeowners, ordinary people, didn't receive any help from the government. And no longer there is American dream that we can realize. And that's why we will no longer be silent. And Russia, finally. Uh, this comes from one of the opposition leaders. A life of a mute cattle was the way to win stability. But we have voices and votes, and if necessary, the power to uphold them. After all, our government is our hired worker, our hired servant. Identifying where the true power lies, with whom. Simple devising or activizing discourses oftentimes make people um, in, in a kind of shift the mentality of the people, the mindset, from apathy to, towards action. So, what are the other, I think, factors that contribute to the movement emergence? Um, I would argue that indeed, oftentimes it takes only one person to mobilize people, to shatter the appearance of, of a normal country, which in fact that country is not normal. And um, Jack again referred to Václav Havel, uh, who, who uses this, this very kind of uh, um, uh, famous uh, reference to greengrocer who gets up in the morning every day and puts, up on, puts out on the, um, uh, on the shop window of his shop uh, the, the sign uh, workers of the world unite and he is doing that unconsciously for several years but what he does he's supporting the system that expects him to do this every day but in one morning he gets up and decides not to do that and he, by refusing or by just uh, not following established customary rule, he, in essence, questioned the system in entirety because the system is based on a lie. 
and even one grain of truth can shatter the, the lie. And the importance of, uh, of one person um, is, is also discussed in this very brief um, TED talk, which I would like to play for you. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed but they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. In that slide, I, I wanted to focus on this lone nut, the first guy. Yes, he said that we shouldn't gl over glorify the leadership. But I think what is important is that the second follower would, wouldn't be the second follower if, without that first person. The first person can shatter the world of appearances, can uh, really make a difference in terms of uh, standing for or against, for example, injustice. Uh, because again, the system, particularly the one that is based entirely on lie, is very, is very much afraid of a single seat of truth. And it has to eliminate that single seat of truth before the follower, the second follower, shows up. That's why, for example, Chinese government so ferociously is going after single individuals because it's, it's, it's concerned that, that they may eventually mobilize um, millions. So other interesting, uh, I think, elements behind the kind of movement uh, mobilization, movement formation. Uh, I identify that as a kind of regime actions. Uh, in this specific example, it's brazenly anti-intellectual acts by the regime. This happened in Russia. This comes from the picture that went viral. It's uh, the results of the elections uh, in December, on December 4th, uh, on December 3rd, published on December 4th, um, in one of the regions. And, uh, and you know, the first, the, on the first position is United Russian Party, United Russia, the governing party. Uh, you see that the anchor, the, the TV anchor is quite puzzled. And she has a good reason to be. <laughs> she is puzzled because when you add up all those numbers, you will not get 100%. <laughs> you will, in fact, get 146%. <laughs> so, someone in the Russian government was smart enough to add points to, most likely, United Russia, without taking some points from other parties. <laughs> All right? So, 
So of course, <laughs> so of course, you know, Russians that cherish them, you know, mathematical skills, statistical skills, <laughs> they thought that, shoot, if you want to actually, you know, falsify elections, do it in, uh, do it in a in a way that we don't notice. <laughs> don't offend our intellect. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you had 100. The reference to 146 percent was constant over the over the period of protest, and it's still going on. Uh, and this is the, actually the, the chairman of the of the electoral committee committee in Russia, uh, Trudov, uh, and um, and one of the protesters. <laughs> okay, reality doesn't match to the rulers claim that we are living in normal country. This is also a kind of part of this of offending uh, human intellect. Uh, when the leaders are claiming we live in a normal country, why do you rebel? Uh, well, that comes again from Russia. So in one of the Siberian towns, when the protests started kind of uh, brewing, um, some of the um, um, activists put out logo toys. Uh, and those logo toys, you know, uh, uh, we're demanding a lot of political things, you know, fair and free elections. Uh, uh, why do we have uh, a criminal in Kremlin rather than in jail? So the police came. They looked at those logo toys and they thought, wow, this protest is illegal actually. <laughs> and the next move was to arrest the toys. <laughs> okay, they arrested the toys. But, but they, they, were thought, they thought, well, we are not smart enough because we don't know what, exactly whether that, what we did was the right thing or legal thing. So we will ask the court to actually uh, rule whether indeed what we did was the right thing to do or the, the legal thing to do and lawful. And the court agreed with the police. It said that logo toys cannot protest. <laughs> Only people can protest. And from now on in Russia, logo toys, logo to toys can be arrested anytime, any day at any places. <laughs> now, what kind of normality is that, that you can arrest logo toys in a country that Putin is claiming that it's normal and it's powerful? So are they afraid of toys? Uh, in a more kind of, you know, um, less uh, perhaps, you know, uh, entertaining example comes from Egypt. When uh, the Egyptian authorities, the interior ministry that, is, that was interviewed in um, uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, before the revolution, whether there is a torture in Egypt. And he was saying, no, our police is the most professional police force you know, in the region, if not in the world. We don't actually torture people. There is nothing, there is nothing like this, like, there is nothing like torture in Egypt. And we know um, how many people died. This actually comes um, of the, the picture of uh, Khalid Said uh, and, and how many people were tortured uh, in Egyptian prisons. That didn't correspond with the kind of uh, argument that Egypt is a normal country which, which, which doesn't, it's not affected by the, by the torture, by the police. Uh, this comes from Belarus. Uh, at one moment uh, in 2010, 2011, Belarusian activists uh, were coming on the square um, and, um, and they just stood and suddenly they started clapping uh, their hands. Or their mobiles um, went on and they started beeping. Uh, so Lukashenko thought that this is not part of what he considers normal behavior. So he asked his parliament to introduce a law which says that if you are in Belarus, you cannot do nothing. It's illegal in Belarus to stand. It's illegal in Belarus to do nothing. All right? So then the people can ask themselves, are we living in a normal country where I can be imprisoned for doing nothing? Yes. Okay, visualization of injustice and growing awareness about that. That's the role of this kind of the people who are constituting the nascent movement, perhaps. In Tunisia, that was the role of Takrits. Uh, they were the kind of net, net citizen or, or, or activists online that were uh, bringing, I think, the, the visual, visualizing the, the corruption and injustice that Tunisians were living under um, uh, as part of the Ben Ali regime. She, uh, actually, one of the uh, Takrit's activists uh, looked at uh, presidential planes uh, and he was relying on, um, uh, on the hobbyists uh, who were uh, making photos of presidential uh, VIP planes in Europe, 
landing at different airports in Europe. And he, uh, in essence, uh, um, managed to identify the photos that were uh, showing the um, Tunisian presidential plane spotted in different parts of Europe. And between 2002 and 2007, there were 17 uh, um, pictures uh, at 17 different airports in 17 different um, countries in Europe of the Tunisian presidential plane spotted. Uh, and however, officially, uh, Ben Ali traveled only three times to Europe on the pres uh, with the official visit uh, to European countries. And they also noticed the pattern that usually those planes were flying to Geneva, to Monaco, to Paris, uh, very nice places where you can do a lot of shopping and, uh, and take, uh, take rest. And uh, in essence, they were uncovering the abuse of power by the wife of the president, who was using private planes to fly over Europe to do shopping. Uh, this comes from uh, uh, Russian activists comparing how the mayor of London goes to work. He bikes. The mayor of New York takes subway. The mayor of Moscow takes a VIP car. And, uh, and there is the whole campaign in, in Russia, of, which is called Blue Basket Campaign in Russia, because oftentimes those, those VIP cars that really don't uh, follow the, the traffic rules, they are responsible for a number of accidents, for injuries, and, and even for uh, accidental killings. Uh, and uh, this is, in essence, to uh, bring this visualization of the uh, injustice uh, existing in, um, uh, in, in Russia, a small kind of small part of that injustice. OK, uh, another um, uh, aspect is that uh, of the kind of movement emergence uh, or resistance emergence is uh, uh, the resistance against humiliation. And that comes again from Russia. I mean, Russia is really uh, constituting a very interesting example of the, for the movement formation and emergence. So that's why I have so many references to that. So we know that uh, Russian uh, activists, as well as the movement, is using the, uh, the symbol of the white ribbon. Uh, and that was what Putin, even before the movement emerged, that was when hundreds of people just demonstrated against rig elections at the beginning of December. And he had an interview on, on public TV about, about the, the ribbons. So I have to say honestly, when I saw on television several people, and there were indeed several people, wearing these things on their chest, I know it's incident, but anyway, I thought it, it was some kind of propaganda, you know, campaign against AIDS, as if they put a condom there and tied it for some reason. So what would you expect uh, after this kind of interview? Well, here is the demonstrations. Okay, we don't use president. Well, pre it's pres preservative is the equivalent of condom. And there were, you know, different images of condoms everywhere. Putin, you know, in babushka-style condom. Um, and even the, um, the critics, the literary critics, dress up as condoms and, and uh, performing on the stage and mobilizing people. Uh, it completely backfired. Turning humiliation into a weapon. He was also referring, uh, Putin, referring to his favorite book, is actually Jungle Book. Uh, and he was referring to his own people as Bandelok. Bandelok is a monkey nation. Uh, and he was saying, well, what can I say to those people? Just come to me, Bandeloks. And that was, again, on, on, on TV. And um, the issue is that um, that was the call by Python in the Jungle Book, which after that call, he called all the monkeys and then suffocated them. So what Russians did? Well, we are not Bandeloks. Actually, we are citizens of Russia. Did you get it, Python? Uh, you called us, we came. Uh, and you know, uh, stopped uh, suffocating the country, and uh, we have to stop feeding the python. That's what you know, brought uh, a number of Russians uh, uh, to, the, to the streets. Again, being told, uh, not asked about the changes, important political changes, and treating people as they are sheep, as they are toads. Um, that was also in Tunisia. People were told what to do. People were told what to watch. People were told what to listen to. People were, um, uh, essentially, the, um, um, the rulers were, were treating um, uh, people as infants. But in contrast, we actually tend to listen to the infants. Uh, and, uh, and that um, um, produced the whole kind of opposition against, um, in, this, uh, in, in this specific example, against uh, Tunisian dictator. 
Uh, there is a rejection of arrogant presumptuousness about people's inability to self-organize. Well, Putin was referring to um, the emerging protest as being uh, kind of Western-induced and Western-supported, that people are paid during that protest um, using foreign money. And you know, there are students also being part of that protest, but I know that students are poor. They are justified, actually, um, by taking the, the, the foreign money. After all, you know, we, we don't provide them with much scholarship. Um, so what then happened during those protests? Well, I'm here unpaid. Well, actually, Obama paid me in person. <laughs> okay. <coughs> and Vladimir Putin, I'm here not for money. I dislike you free of charge. <laughs> All right. Okay. And finally, there is a waking of a self-conscious, dignified person that we oftentimes see in those uh, more visual and public protests. Now, I'm not vegetable, I'm human being, we are not slaves, we are not dogs serving, giving power and, 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 and speaking and standing, doing all the tricks. Uh, and, but everything uh, in terms of being awakened depends on us uh, and uh, on what we do. And oftentimes, uh, even before the movement emerges, there is uh, an interesting, in terms of looking, if you look at the language and discourse uh, between the movement and the authorities, there is a, a distinction between the emphasis on life, representing life, versus what the regime represents, which is death. And there are a couple of quotes that I collected from various struggles. His language smelled like death. Uh, it's one of the uh, Serbian activists talking about Milosevic. Uh, please tell the world how much, we love, how much we, we love life. We just want to be free, an activist from Iran. In Yemen, we ask for life, and they are killing us. And uh, Tiananmen people, at, uh, uh, during the, the hunger strike, we are not in search of death. We are looking for real life. Uh, there is uh, certainly the, the, the civil resistance uh, at its core, it's a manifestation of life. It's an affirmation of life uh, versus uh, death that is uh, offered by, by the regime. And then also uh, another kind of uh, um, interesting discourse, it's about uh, which, which is relying on humor versus wrongdoing. A um, couple of jokes from Egyptian struggle. I'm dentist, I'm here to approach you. Uh, and, um, and the joke coming from, um, uh, from Russia, you can read yourself. Um, that's about you know, the, the, the falsifications of the elections, the numbers. And of course, the percentage of jokes about the rigged elections versus the percentage of jokes in total uh, online, it should be, of course, 50-50%, uh, which is already amazing. But there was 75%, 75%. Um, and, uh, and actually, there is an interesting um, uh, studies uh, on, uh, about the humor, uh, the use of humor in, um, in communist uh, Soviet Union. Uh, and um, the author is, is, is claiming that uh, um, the rate of jokes uh, against regime usually spiked uh, uh, just before the, uh, the popular upheavals uh, in Soviet Union. And so no one did uh, research because that would require, I think, quite a lot of archival work uh, and quite a lot, a lot of work even if we look at the current uh, uh, regimes, uh, current kind of struggles, to look at the uh, number of political jokes uh, and, and correlate that with movement emergence and movement formation. I think we would find a very interesting uh, data and an interesting uh, reflection on the, on the use of humor or the impact of humor um, on the political struggle. Uh, what is also taking place um, 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 during the movement formation, it's uh, that essentially strengthens that, um, the rise of resistance. It's uh, re-imagining of uh, who we are in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of our country, the relationship between me as a citizen and the relationship uh, and, 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 and the country that that I'm living. Uh, and I think this, this uh, uh, poster that comes from the uh, Occupy Wall Street, the dissent is patriotic. It's, it's quite telling. Uh, this is oftentimes about rediscovering our national identity. Uh, the struggle against authoritarian regimes are oftentimes compared to occupation struggles. This is the struggle with occupier. He's no longer our dictator. He's, he, he became, via his own actions, a foreign dictator. That is on our land occupying us. 
And um, this, this is the kind of reclaiming the national space, reclaiming the country from a foreign um, occupier, which, uh, uh, which before uh, may have been defined as a kind of domestic dictator and we can kind of deal with, and we can kind of obey him. Uh, but he's no longer that, that kind of dictator. He's an occupier. So there was a lot of discourse in, uh, during the, um, uh, the, the first kind of uh, days in, um, of mobilizing people in Egypt in terms of protecting the country, saving the country from, from the government, uh, be, remaining peaceful because we don't want to betray the country. Uh, in Syria, it's a powerful, I think, quote uh, coming from one of the Syrian journalists. They are armed and we are unarmed. If they want to kill us, they can kill us. If they want to arrest us, they can arrest us. But no matter how much, how much blood gets spilled and how violent it gets, this is our country. We are not giving up. And with this country, with the emphasis or discourse on protecting the country, redefining uh, our patriotism and uh, our citizenship, it comes also uh, emphasis on rescuing future generations, which is, uh, I found that very, um, uh, interesting uh, in terms of uh, movement's emergence. Um, and a couple of quotes um, coming from, from different uh, Egyptians that were part of the, of the movement. We are here to protect our children. What, um, I don't want my child to suffer the same I suffered. Um, and um, in Russia, this is the poster that says, I want to give birth to free children in free country. Defend future of your children. One day, she will ask you, Daddy, what have you done when crooks and thieves robbed our country? And again, Syrian journalist. Uh, no, wet, no matter whether Assad fails this year or this decade, Syria is already irreversibly fundamentally changed. Fathers in Dera insist that they will happy, happily die to secure the futures of their daughters and their sons. And if their children must die too for the next generation, then no sacrifice will be spared. Again, this notion that I'm fighting for for the freedom of my children. If not my children, then the children of my children uh, is, is present there. And, uh, and one, I think, of the important um, uh, aspects or attributes of a successful movement emergence is the involvement of what I call a political, seemingly a political agents of change or actors. Mothers of the disappeared, mothers as, as actors of change, uh, lawyers as actors of change in Pakistan, uh, artists as actors of change in Russia, children as actors of change in Syria. They are powerful symbols of um, kind of civic spirit and, uh, and, and symbol of, of um, they represent the public, they represent society, not the politics as such. They fight for the humanity. Uh, they are also, um, uh, uh, the help for movement mobilization comes from different types of tactics, particularly the ones that I would call spectacular or dramatic tactics that could be implemented by single individuals. This comes uh, from Russia, which says, Putin, you have to go. And um, the significance of the place where they put this poster is quite important because it's next to the Kremlin walls. Putin got up in the morning and that's what he saw uh, facing the, um, uh, his, his office. Uh, uh, and it took probably a couple of activists to put up this, this, this sign. Uh, this also comes from Russia. Um, uh, in order to galvanize people to go out from their homes, heated homes, and participate in the protests where the temperature was minus 25 centigrade, which, is, which means that the water in your eyeballs is freezing. This is the temperature where people had to be mobilized to go on the street and protest. You had this activist uh, woman who is, who is saying that the cold it's not something that we should, we should be afraid of and come and protest. And this is the temperature that I'm talking about when uh, that picture is taken. Um, this comes from Syria. Um, the, um, um, the dying of fountains in Damascus uh, and around Damascus in color red to symbolize the death of a couple of thousands of nonviolent protesters in order to remind people that the struggle continues, uh, the nonviolent struggle continues. Um, another, you know, if um, another kind of act uh, that oftentimes uh, goes viral uh, and mobilize people. So if those two sweeties can, uh, it's, uh, that's President, at that times still President Medvedev in December. Of course, we can do that as well. Um, and um, you know, 
it's shameful that they are not there if my grandma is already in the protest. Um, and finally, we are all in this together. We can be arrested, we can be tortured, regardless if we are part of the protest or not. A number of activists, uh, this example comes from Russia, um, you know, staged the protest and there were uh, 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 people who were passing by the protest. And even those people who were not engaged in the protest, they were arrested, they were questioned, they were harassed. And we can find probably a number of examples from other struggles where bystanders, just because they were there, they were arrested. So if I can be arrested, if I can be tortured uh, for doing nothing, it's better if I do something. Uh, at least there is a reason. Um, and, and then, at one moment, the movement becomes fashionable. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, life becomes the resistance, and resistance becomes life. And this, uh, this is the example of uh, a white ribbon, how it spread it. It could be another symbol from Otpor, which um, uh, Ivan will be talking about, the spread of the fist uh, uh, of, as, a, as a form of uh, resistance. And diffusion of nonviolent resistance in terms of ideas and practice. Again, coming from Russia, at uh, that time, around December, uh, Václav Havel died, and Russians were saying, we need our own Václav Havel to lead our struggle. We need our own Gandhi. This comes from uh, uh, one of the actual participants, FSI participant, Dalia Zaida. She produced those uh, brochures uh, about the Montgomery bus boycott, translated in, in Arabic and distributed 30,000 copies in 2010 to Egyptians, um, spreading the, the kind of ideas and practice of nonviolent resistance. So, in conclusion, this is the last slide. The last slide. There is always a longing for dignity in us, regardless whether we are, how much we are humiliated, and uh, we have to, in order to mobilize the movement, we have to make the cause meaningful and and popular by various types of actions, uh, even the more kind of spectacular and dramatic ones. Uh, oftentimes, we owe that struggle to our country and to our loved ones, and there is that the resistance will not, su will not succeed unless we will be part of that. The uh, Henry Lufamer, uh, the, 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 the one, the, the activist that Jack uh, um, uh, showed the picture of, uh, uh, that essentially he had, she had to be part of the struggle in order to, for that struggle to, to go on and be eventually victorious. And others, uh, other struggles and other people in other countries can, can give us inspiration and example. Um, to form the movement and to lead the resistance.